Chapter 15, Part 2 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Conaway Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt Chapter 15, The Peace of Righteousness, Part 2 in my own judgment, the most important service that I rendered to peace was the voyage of the battle fleet round the world. I had become convinced that for many reasons it was essential that we should have it clearly understood, by our own people especially, but also by other peoples, that the Pacific was as much our home waters as the Atlantic, and that our fleet could and would at will pass from one to the other of the two great oceans. It seemed to me evident that such a voyage would greatly benefit the Navy itself, would arouse popular interest in and enthusiasm for the Navy, and would make foreign nations accept as a matter of course that our fleet should from time to time be gathered in the Pacific, just as from time to time it was gathered in the Atlantic, and that its presence in one ocean was no more to be accepted as a mark of hostility to any Asiatic power then its presence in the Atlantic was to be accepted as a mark of hostility to any European power. I determined on the move without consulting the cabinet, precisely as I took Panama without consulting the cabinet. A council of war never fights, and in a crisis the duty of a leader is to lead, and not to take refuge behind the generally timid wisdom of a multitude of counselors. At that time, as I happen to know, Neither the English nor the German authorities believed it possible to take a fleet of great battleships round the world. They did not believe that their own fleets could perform the feat, and still less did they believe that the American fleet could. I made up my mind that it was time to have a showdown in the matter, because if it was really true that our fleet could not get from the Atlantic to the Pacific, it was much better to know it and be able to shape our policy in view of the knowledge. Many persons publicly and privately protested against the move on the ground that Japan would accept it as a threat. To this I answered nothing in public. In private I said that I did not believe Japan would so regard it, because Japan knew my sincere friendship and admiration for her, and realized that we could not as a nation have any intention of attacking her, and that if there were any such feeling on the part of Japan, as was alleged, that very fact rendered it imperative that that fleet should go. When in the spring of 1910 I was in Europe, I was interested to find that high naval authorities in both Germany and Italy had expected that war would come at the time of the voyage. They asked me if I had not been afraid of it, and if I had not expected that hostilities would begin at least by the time that the fleet reached the Straits of Magellan. I answered that I did not expect it, that I believed that Japan would feel as friendly in the matter as we did, but that if my expectations had proved mistaken, it would have been proof positive that we were going to be attacked anyhow, and that in such an event it would have been an enormous gain to have had the three months preliminary preparation which enabled the fleet to start perfectly equipped. In a personal interview before they left, I had explained to the officers in command that I believed the trip would be one of absolute peace, but that they were to take exactly the same precautions against sudden attack of any kind, as if we were at war with all the nations of the earth, and that no excuse of any kind would be accepted if there were a sudden attack of any kind and we were taken unawares. My prime purpose was to impress the American people, and this purpose was fully achieved. The crews did make a very deep impression abroad, Boasting about what we have done does not impress foreign nations at all, except unfavorably, but positive achievement does. And the two American achievements that really impressed foreign peoples during the first dozen years of this century were the digging of the Panama Canal and the crews of the battle fleet round the world. But the impression made on our own people was of far greater consequence. No single thing in the history of the new United States Navy has done as much to stimulate popular interest and belief in it as the world cruise. This effect was forecast in a well-informed and friendly English periodical 
The London Spectator. Writing in October 1907, a month before the fleet sailed from Hampton Roads, the Spectator said, All over America, the people will follow the movements of the fleet. They will learn something of the intricate details of the cooling and commissariat work under warlike conditions. And in a word, their attention will be aroused. Next time Mr. Roosevelt or his representatives appeal to the country for new battleships, they will do so to people whose minds have been influenced one way or the other. The naval program will not have stood still. We are sure that, apart from increasing the efficiency of the existing fleet, this is the aim which Mr. Roosevelt had in mind. He has a policy which projects itself far into the future, but it is an entire misreading of it to suppose that it is aimed narrowly and definitely at any single power. I first directed the fleet of 16 battleships to go round through the Straits of Magellan to San Francisco. From thence, I ordered them to New Zealand and Australia, then to the Philippines, China, and Japan, and home through Suez. They stopped in the Mediterranean to help the sufferers from the earthquake at Messina, by the way, and did this work as effectively as they had done all their other work. Admiral Evans commanded the fleet to San Francisco. There, Admiral Sperry took it. Admirals Thomas, Wainwright, and Schroeder rendered distinguished service under Evans and Sperry. The cooling and other preparations were made in such excellent shape by the department that there was never a hitch, not so much as the delay of an hour, in keeping every appointment made. All the repairs were made without difficulty. The ship concerned merely falling out of column for a few hours, and when the job was done steaming at speed until she regained her position. Not a ship was left in any port, and there was hardly a desertion. As soon as it was known that the voyage was to be undertaken, men crowded to enlist, just as freely from the Mississippi Valley as from the seaboard, and for the first time since the Spanish War the ships put to sea overmanned, and by a stalwart a set of men-of-war's men as ever looked through a porthole, game for a fight or a frolic, but withal so self-respecting and with such a sense of responsibility that in all the ports in which they landed their conduct was exemplary. The fleet practiced incessantly during the voyage, both with the guns and in battle tactics, and came home a much more efficient fighting instrument than when it started 16 months before. The best men of command rank in our own service were confident that the fleet would go round in safety, in spite of the incredulity of foreign critics. Even they, however, did not believe that it was wise to send the torpedo craft around. I accordingly acquiesced in their views, as it did not occur to me to consult the lieutenants. But shortly before the fleet started, I went in the government yacht, Mayflower, to inspect the target practice off Provincetown. I was accompanied by two torpedo boat destroyers, in charge of a couple of naval lieutenants, thorough gamecocks, and I had the two lieutenants aboard to dine one evening. Towards the end of the dinner, they could not refrain from asking if the torpedo flotilla was to go round with the big ships. I told them no, that the admirals and captains did not believe that the torpedo boats could stand it, and believed that the officers and crews aboard the cockle shells would be worn out by the constant pitching and bouncing and the everlasting need to make repairs. My two guests chorused an eager assurance that the boats could stand it. They assured me that the enlisted men were even more anxious to go than were the officers, mentioning that on one of their boats the terms of enlistment of most of the crew were out, and the men were waiting to see whether or not to re-enlist, as they did not care to do so unless the boats were to go on the cruise. I answered that I was only too glad to accept the word of the men who were to do the job, and that they should certainly go, and within half an hour I sent out the order for the flotilla to be got ready. It went round in fine shape, not a boat being laid up. I felt that the feat reflected even more credit upon the Navy than did the circumnavigation of the big ships, and I wrote the flotilla commander the following letter. May 18, 1908 My dear Captain Cohn, A great deal of attention has been paid to the feat of our battleship fleet in encircling South America and getting to San Francisco and it would be hard too highly to compliment the officers and enlisted men of that fleet for what they have done. 
Yet if I should draw any distinction at all, it would be in favor of you and your associates who have taken out the torpedo flotilla. Yours was an even more notable feat, and every officer and every enlisted man in the torpedo boat flotilla has the right to feel that he has rendered distinguished service to the United States Navy, and therefore to the people of the United States. And I wish I could thank each of them personally. Will you have this letter read by the commanding officer of each torpedo boat to his officers and crew? Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Lieutenant Commander Hutch I. Cohn, USN, Commanding, 2nd Torpedo, Flotilla, Care Master, San Francisco Cal. There were various amusing features connected with the trip. Most of the wealthy people and leaders of opinion in the eastern cities were panic-struck at the proposal to take the fleet away from Atlantic waters. The great New York dailies issued frantic appeals to Congress to stop the fleet from going. The head of the Senate Committee on Naval Affairs announced that the fleet should not and could not go because Congress would refuse to appropriate the money, he being from an eastern seaboard state. However, I announced in response that I had enough money to take the fleet around to the Pacific anyhow, that the fleet would certainly go, and that if Congress did not choose to appropriate enough money to get the fleet back, why, it would stay in the Pacific. There was no further difficulty about the money. It was not originally my intention that the fleet should visit Australia, but the Australian government sent a most cordial invitation, which I gladly accepted, for I have, as every American ought to have, a hearty admiration for and fellow feeling with Australia, and I believe that America should be ready to stand back of Australia in any serious emergency. The reception accorded the fleet in Australia was wonderful and it showed the fundamental community of feeling between ourselves and the great commonwealth of the South Seas. The considerate, generous, and open-handed hospitality with which the entire Australian people treated our officers and men could not have been surpassed had they been our own countrymen. The fleet first visited Sydney, which has a singularly beautiful harbor. The day after the arrival, one of our captains noticed a member of his crew trying to go to sleep on a bench in the park. He had fixed above his head a large paper with some lines evidently designed to forestall any questions from friendly would-be hosts. I am delighted with the Australian people. I think your harbor the finest in the world. I am very tired and would like to go to sleep. The most noteworthy incident of the cruise was the reception given to our fleet in Japan. In courtesy and good breeding, the Japanese can certainly teach much to the nations of the Western world. I had been very sure that the people of Japan would understand aright what the cruise meant, and would accept the visit of our fleet as the signal honor which it was meant to be, a proof of the high regard and friendship I felt, and which I was certain the American people felt, for the great island empire. The event even surpassed my expectations. I cannot too strongly express my appreciation of the generous courtesy the Japanese showed the officers and crews of our fleet and I may add that every man of them came back a friend and admirer of the Japanese. Admiral Sperry wrote me a letter of much interest, dealing not only with the reception in Tokyo, but with the work of our men at sea. I herewith give it almost in full. 28 October 1908 Dear Mr. Roosevelt, My official report of the visit to Japan goes forward in this mail but there are certain aspects of the affair so successfully concluded which cannot well be included in the report. You are perhaps aware that Mr. Dennison of the Japanese Foreign Office was one of my colleagues at The Hague, for whom I have very high regard. Desiring to avoid every possibility of trouble or misunderstanding, I wrote to him last June explaining fully the character of our men, which they have so well lived up to. The desirability of ample landing places, guides, rest houses, and places for changing money in order that there might be no delay in getting the men away from the docks on the excursions in which they delight. Very few of them go into a drinking place, except to get a resting place not to be found elsewhere, paying for it by taking a drink. I also explained our system of landing with liberty men, an unarmed patrol, properly officered, to quietly take in charge and send off to their ships any man who showed the slightest trace of disorderly conduct. This letter he showed to the Minister of the Navy, who highly approved of all our arrangements, including the patrol, of which I feared they might be jealous. Mr. Dennison's reply reached me in Manila, 
with a memorandum from the Minister of the Navy which removed all doubts. Three temporary piers were built for our boat landings, each 300 feet long, brilliantly lighted and decorated. The sleeping accommodations did not permit two or three thousand sailors to remain on shore, but the ample landings permitted them to be handled night and day with perfect order and safety. At the landings and railroad station in Yokohama, there were rest houses or booths, reputable money changers, and as many as a thousand English-speaking Japanese college students acted as volunteer guides, besides Japanese sailors and petty officers detailed for the purpose. In Tokyo, there were a great many excellent refreshment places, where the men got excellent meals and could rest, smoke, and write letters, and in none of these places would they allow the men to pay anything, though they were more than ready to do so. The arrangements were marvelously perfect. As soon as your telegram of October 18, giving the address to be made to the emperor, was received, I gave copies of it to our ambassador to be sent to the foreign office. It seems that the emperor had already prepared a very cordial address to be forwarded through me to you after delivery at the audience, but your telegram reversed the situation and his reply was prepared. I am convinced that your kind and courteous initiative on this occasion helped cause the pleasant feeling which was so obvious in the Emperor's bearing at the luncheon which followed the audience. X, who is reticent and conservative, told me that not only the Emperor but all the ministers were profoundly gratified by the course of events. I am confident that not even the most trifling incident has taken place which could in any way mar the general satisfaction and our ambassador has expressed to me his great satisfaction with all that has taken place. Owing to heavy weather encountered on the passage up from Manila, the fleet was obliged to take about 3,500 tons of coal. The Yankton remained behind to keep up communication for a few days, and yesterday she transmitted the Emperor's telegram to you, which was sent in reply to your message through our ambassador after the sailing of the fleet. It must be profoundly gratifying to you to have the mission on which you sent the fleet terminate so happily, and I am profoundly thankful that, owing to the confidence which you displayed in giving me this command, my active career draws to a close with such honorable distinction. As for the effect of the crews upon the training, discipline, and effectiveness of the fleet, the good cannot be exaggerated. It is a war game in every detail. The wireless communication has been maintained with an efficiency hitherto unheard of. Between Honolulu and Auckland, 3,850 miles, we were out of communication with a cable station for only one night, whereas three non-American men of war trying recently to maintain a chain of only 1,250 miles between Auckland and Sydney were only able to do so for a few hours. The officers and men, as soon as we put to sea, turn to their gunnery and tactical work far more eagerly than they go to functions. Every morning, certain ships leave the column and move off seven or eight thousand yards as targets for range measuring, fire control, and battery practice for the others. And at night, certain ships do the same thing for night battery practice. I am sorry to say that this practice is unsatisfactory, and in some points misleading, owing to the fact that the ships are painted white. At Portland, in 1903, I saw Admiral Barker's white battleships under the searchlights of the enemy at a distance of 14,000 yards, seven sea miles, without glasses, while the Hartford, a black ship, was never discovered at all, though she passed within a mile and a half. I have for years, while a member of the general board, advocated painting the ship's war color at all times, and by this mail I am asking the department to make the necessary change in the regulations and paint the ships properly. I do not know that anyone now dissents from my view. Admiral Wainwright strongly concurs, and the War College Conference recommended it year after year without a dissenting voice. In the afternoons, the fleet has two or three hours practice at battle maneuvers, which excite as keen interest as gunnery exercises. The competition in coal economy goes on automatically and reacts in a hundred ways. It has reduced the waste in the use of electrical light and water and certain chief engineers are said to keep men ranging over the ships all night, turning out every light not in actual and immediate use. Perhaps the most important effect is the keen hunt for defects in the machinery causing waste of power. The Yankton, by resetting valves, increased her speed from 10 to 11.5 knots on the same expenditure. All this has been done, but the field is widening. The work has only begun. C.S. Sperry 
When I left the presidency, I finished seven and a half years of administration, during which not one shot had been fired against a foreign foe. We were at absolute peace, and there was no nation in the world with whom a war cloud threatened, no nation in the world whom we had wronged, or from whom we had anything to fear. The cruise of the battle fleet was not the least of the causes which ensured so peaceful an outlook. When the fleet returned after its 16 months voyage around the world, I went down to Hampton Roads to greet it. The day was Washington's birthday, February 22, 1907, literally on the minute the homing battlecraft came into view. On the flagship of the Admiral, I spoke to the officers and enlisted men as follows. Admiral Sperry, officers, and men of the battle fleet. Over a year has passed since you steamed out of this harbor, and over the world's rim, and this morning the hearts of all who saw you thrilled with pride as the holes of the mighty warships lifted above the horizon. You have been in the northern and the southern hemispheres. Four times you have crossed the line. You have steamed through all the great oceans. You have touched the coast of every continent. Ever your general course has been westward, and now you come back to the port from which you set sail. This is the first battle fleet that has ever circumnavigated the globe. Those who perform the feat again can but follow in your footsteps. The little torpedo flotilla went with you around South America, through the Straits of Magellan, to our own Pacific coast. The armored cruiser squadron met you, and left you again, when you were halfway round the world. You have falsified every prediction of the prophets of failure. In all your long cruise, not an accident worthy of mention has happened to a single battleship nor yet to the cruisers or torpedo boats. You left this coast in a high state of battle efficiency, and you return with your efficiency increased, better prepared than when you left, not only in personal, but even in material. During your world cruise, you have taken your regular gunnery practice, and skilled though you were before with the guns, you have grown more skillful still, and through practice you have improved in battle tactics, though here there is more room for improvement than in your gunnery. Incidentally, I suppose I need hardly say that one measure of your fitness must be your clear recognition of the need always steadily to strive to render yourselves more fit. If ever you grow to think that you are fit enough, you can make up your minds that from that moment you will begin to go backward. As a war machine, the fleet comes back in better shape than it went out. In addition, you, the officers and men of this formidable fighting force, have shown yourselves the best of all possible ambassadors and heralds of peace. Wherever you have landed, you have borne yourself so as to make us at home proud of being your countrymen. You have shown that the best type of fighting man of the sea knows how to appear to the utmost possible advantage when his business is to behave himself on shore and to make a good impression in a foreign land. We are proud of all the ships and all the men in this whole fleet and we welcome you home to the country whose good repute among nations has been raised by what you have done. End of chapter 15 Recording by Cameron Conaway